Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> well, let's see where I am here. Okay, good evening, everyone. This is the 81st session of the Carl Jung Deb Psychology Reading Group. And uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, The Secret of the Golden Flower, which was uh, an early work of Dr. Jung's. I'm going to talk about it in a few minutes, but I wanted to start with, um, wanted to start uh, by reading to you a, uh, a poem that was related to last week's um, session. And this poem expresses the malaise, the sort of angst of our age. It was written in 1852, believe it or not, by a man named Matthew Arnold, who became a professor of poetry at Cambridge. And uh, it was mentioned in Dr. Edward Edinger's uh, lecture about the encounters with the greater personality. And in that lecture, Dr. Edinger said that when he was a young man, uh, lovers would recite this poem uh, to one another and so I, I'm going to recite it to you. It's, it's not that long. It'll take a minute or two, a couple of minutes maybe. It's called Dover Beach, and this is expressing the angst in the middle of the 19th century. Dover Beach. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair. Upon the straits, on the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land, listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling. At their return, up the high strand, begin and cease, and then again begin, with tremendous cadence slow, and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles, long ago, heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once, too, at the full, and round earth's shore lay like, the, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind, down the vast edges drear, and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another, for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here, as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. So that was a reading of Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. It is published on the website of the Poetry Foundation, Poetry Ma uh, Magazine. And um, just for purposes of bringing everybody along on Jungian psychology, I want to uh, again give you the link. This is uh, Dr. Edward Edinger's Encounters with the Greater Personality, and this is the link to it. 
I prepared a transcript of it. Oh, it doesn't like that because the link is too long. So let me see if, okay. All right, so here's the link. And that's from uh, Encounters of the Greater Personality. And uh, one other that I think that everyone should be familiar with because these are both um, these are both lectures that Dr. Edinger gave in the 1980s, which give us a very excellent uh, summation of Dr. Jung's oeuvre and its meaning to us now. And this is uh, the second one is called Individuation, a Myth for Modern Man. And uh, so here's the link to that. And that's just so you have it available to you uh, for the future. And we're not going to talk about it directly tonight, but if we do, we have the link available. So uh, tonight I promised to talk about um, the secret of the golden flower and uh, specifically Dr. C.G. Jung's commentary on it. Um, this essay of Dr. Jung's appears in uh, volume 13 of the collected works in Alchemical Studies by Dr. C.G. Jung, uh, published by Princeton University Press. And it's the first essay in the book and it's rather long it's 55 pages long so i think there's no chance of finishing it uh, tonight um, but uh, i will start it really amounts to um, a short course an overview course in dr jung's oeuvre and so um I'm going to take it paragraph by paragraph and uh, hopefully make it uh, available to you because a lot of these paragraphs are very complex. Good evening, Dan. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, okay, so um, in order to do that, I need to uh, give you um, my notes, which are here. And I need to adjust my camera just a little bit so that I'm a little more centered in the image here. And um, so the first point that Dr. Jung makes in this essay uh, is that it's difficult for the European to understand the East. And it so happens that I've spent a lot of time in India and Japan especially, also in the Middle East, but uh, I spent eight years in Japan and I also was school trained in Defense Language Institute for Mandarin Chinese. So I do know something about the East and I want to help you appreciate just how difficult this is. Now, you see a character before you and this character is the Japanese character for man. Uh, the Japanese word is otoko, and it's also, it's also a Chinese character. It's Japanese kanji, which means that it comes from Chinese. And this character is actually made up of two characters. On the top, the square part of it, is a rice field, and on the bottom, is a man holding a sword, which represents strength. So the sword is the device that goes down to the lower left in this image. Now, uh, randomly, a bunch of Westerners were approached about this particular image, and they were, asked, they were told this is the Japanese character for man, in which direction is this man going? And the result of the survey was that 90% of all Westerners 
said that the man was going to the right, while 90% of all Japanese said he was going to the left. Now, I think that that uh, reflects the fact that um, Westerners think of running forward, moving forward, leaning into things, whereas the Japanese think in terms of a strong position. And, um, and especially, I gave you the secret at the beginning, the Japanese would see the uh, katana, the sword that comes down uh, to the lower right in this image. And so they would understand that that's the front of the man and that uh, the man is back in a strong position, something like a karate position or something like that. Now, one other reason that this is significant is that um, Thomas asked me, Lachlan or Monterey, actually it was Roslyn. I had a, I had a contract school in Roslyn, Virginia uh, that trained me in Mandarin. Okay, but um, there's something else that Dr. Jung didn't know about, and that is that in about the 1970s, I think, um, there was a Japanese man who had a stroke, unfortunately, and he lost the right side of his brain. And so he didn't have the use of it for reading purposes. And so they did some studies with this man and discovered that he could read the phonetic characters of Japanese. He could read the kana, what are called the kana, hiragana and katakana, or the kana characters of Japanese, but he could not read the Chinese characters, the kanji characters, which it turned out um, you read on the right side of your brain, whereas you read um, phonetic characters as we do with our phonetic Arabic or um, Roman letters. We, we have Roman letters and Japanese also use Roman letters phonetically. And so the Roman letters, the kana, uh, katakana and hiragana, um, all are phonetic and they are read on the left side of the brain. And so you see that um, a Westerner would read um, something, read about something, learn about something entirely on left brain, entirely on the logos side of the brain, whereas a Japanese or a Chinese tends to read, read it on the right side of the brain, at least for Chinese characters, which is the, this is one, and, um, and it's a picture. And I remember when I was facile at this, at one time I was reading over 2,000 Chinese characters, and when I was facile in it, for me, it was very uh, much like seeing pictures on the page and seeing the images go by, as Dr. Young refers to. And, um, but obviously when, when you're reading phonetically, you have to conjure the pictures, you have to create the symbols inside in, uh, in your left brain, or you have to work, work both sides of your brain. And so it's just, I'm just saying that as a, as a example of how differently uh, we actually think uh, between us and um, Japanese or Chinese uh, and some other languages. And um, obviously um, Arabic has certain imagery to it also. And so uh, this is sort of the signi significance of Dr. Young's first paragraph here, which is talking about the European trying to understand the East. And um, so let's move this ahead. If you cannot see these images, please let me know. Um, and so um, Dr. Young comments that uh, Westerners hide, hide their heart um, 
under the cloak of rationality, of scientific understanding, logos. So, um, and what Richard Wilhelm did for Dr. Jung is that he penetrated deeply enough to find this pearl of intuitive insight and it was not pigeonholed by the specialists. And so uh, Dr. Jung was able to understand it from a psychological point of view. And um, there's always a risk, as, do as Dr. Jung points out in paragraph two, of creating another silo. And so Jung's comment here is science must serve it airs when it usurps. And uh, its um, insufficiency must be supported by others. In other words, we need to um, be able to think in proper imagery. And I'm going to use as an example a, a NASA probe that was sent to Mars. And um, the NASA probe was going out to Mars for whatever it was, seven or nine months, and uh, it was supposed to um, orbit Mars. And so it went around the back of Mars, but then uh, when it was supposed to come out the other side, it disappeared. And after a long period of study, what they discovered was that certain parts of the probe, which were um, related to the navigation of the probe, were done with um, uh, metric measure, while at, while um, the um, most of the probe was made in the United States and therefore was non-metric, and so it was. <laughs> so the two, uh, the measures in that were used to build the probe were incompatible, and uh, the result was that that Mars probe just disappeared out into space, and you know it'll. Maybe some alien will find it in a billion years or so and be quizzical about the, uh, the measures. But we have to be able to think through these things beyond just the rigid rationality uh, and the rigid um, uh, mathematics, let's say. Um, so science obscures insight when it claims its understanding is the only kind. What could possibly go wrong? That's what we need to understand. Uh, for example, um, uh, the the words. Uh, let's let's uh, talk about that in terms of the logos in the Constitution of the United States. Well, the Constitution was always very clear to everyone, but now all of a sudden it's not so clear. And so we need to be able to think through and beyond just the words. We need to understand what can possibly go wrong. And so um, Westerners fold, um, so Westerners tend to put Oriental wisdom into a dim box of faith and superstition. And they don't really appreciate um, exactly how the West, the Eastern person uh, might be looking at a specific issue, as, as I explained with Otoko at the beginning of this. So the realism of the East grew from instinct and the highly evolved Chinese mind. And Dr. Jung gained, gained a new um, appreciation for this when in 1928, Richard Wilhelm brought him his translation of The Secret of the Golden Flower. And the result was that he saw some very important things for him. And so um, what happens when a decision that makes sense is piled onto a decision that makes sense is piled onto another decision that makes sense? Well, uh, one example would be uh, 
my metaphor of the stop sign, where uh, it certainly makes sense to put a stop sign at a busy intersection or let's say a less than busy intersection where it would be enough for cars to stop uh, and then go again. But the problem is that if you put that stop sign out in the middle of the prairie, let's say in the middle of Montana or Utah, and you um, put that stop sign there, and when you're coming up to that stop sign, you can see for th five miles in both directions, uh, are you gonna come to a full stop and, and stop completely before you go on? And so this is where we get in to uh, the godlike decisions, which I've discussed earlier, where um, we have to follow uh, Christ's parable of the unjust steward, where uh, Christ came upon a man who was working on uh, the Sabbath, and Christ asked him what he was doing, and the man said, well, I'm working, and Christ said, uh, well, if you know what you're doing, then you are blessed. But if you don't know what you're doing, then you're uh, cursed and a violator of the law. And so this relates to the stop sign. If you know what you're doing and you're out in the middle of the prairie and there's no cars coming in both directions and you can see that clearly, then maybe you don't have to stop so firmly at a stop sign. But if you don't know what you're doing uh, and you just go through a stop sign, you might, you're making a godlike decision and you might kill yourself or someone else. That's the significance of that parable. So, um, so going into paragraph three now, Dr. Young is talking about uh, it, it's similar to the student in Faustus who um, uh, is taking everything word for word. And um, he, if you take over yoga practices word for word, uh, you become a pitiable imitator. So, um, you know, I've often quipped that there are uh, yoga teachers in Nebraska and I've gone to yoga classes at my local gym and uh, what you hear in those yoga classes is um, a teacher who is basically parroting um, Hindu philosophy uh, during the yoga class very often and uh, but the problem is that she's not a Hindu guru. I mean, she's just saying a few nice surface level platitudes, uh, but she's not really understanding uh, what it is she's doing in, in that class. And um, so you can lose yourself in a mist of words and ideas. And uh, this is part of the problem of being uh, too overcome by the logos, as we've talked about on a number of occasions. Um, okay, I'll, let me just look here. Andy Oxide says, is the logos the source of intuitive insight? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> the source of intuitive insight is the eros, the uh, right brain. Um, and Dan Paul says, paragraph two, science must serve it heirs when it usurps the throne. What is the throne? Personal truths. Um, uh, what, it, what it means is that we cannot um, be too rigid in um, our understanding from a logos point of view. I mean, you can learn things, uh, you can learn all the rules when you're in engineering school, let's say, um, but uh, then you have to learn how things really work. And, um, <clears throat> and you know, the same goes for marriage, for example. Um, you know, you can learn all the rules for marriage, uh, both the moral rules and um, 
you know, whatever your father or your mother might tell you, but then you have to um, get married and actually get in bed with your spouse. And you might find that the rules are somewhat different than you thought they were. And uh, you also might find that, that you're in a, in a dance or a wrestling match with the, with the side of your spouse that you don't know that is wrestling with the side of you that you don't know. For example, um, I occasionally find um, my uh, feminine side in a wrestling match with my wife's uh, animus, her masculine side. <laughs> And it, it's, it's always good to be able to know that and uh, to understand that about us. Um, and so, um, so rules are great. The Logos is great. The Logos has got us um, scientific development over the last 500 years, which we would not have if we didn't... Um, uh, have logos and the ability to differentiate things and uh, you know we wouldn't be going to mars at all if we didn't have logos but on the other hand uh, there are bounds we have to understand that there has to be a balance and uh, this is actually one of the reasons why um, in the u.s military there's uh, emphasis on the myers-briggs type indicator because it's always uh, useful, it's all well and good to use your um, sensing thinking side, which is very common among military officers, uh, to make, uh, to work out a, a mission plan, let's say. But um, you need intuitive people to ask the question and understand the possibilities of what could possibly go wrong. And you need the feeling people to understand, you know, whether it's going to work and whether um, people that you're dealing with, uh, uh, civilians perhaps, uh, are going to, um, how they're going to react to you. I'll give you an example. Uh, let's ASVAB, Thomas and Payne. I'm sorry, I don't understand the acronym ASVAB, but if you can give me that, uh, I can respond to your comment. Uh, but during that, while you do that, let me uh, give you an example. While I was uh, serving in Vietnam, it happened that I was an interrogation officer. And um, one of the activities that we did was divide, uh, divide um, people that were captured by the Marines uh, between uh, prisoners of war, uh, civil defendants, uh, which were people who had helped our enemy but were not gun-carrying people, and innocent civilians. And so there came a time when um, a uh, sort of guy who might have been my age now, um, maybe he was in the 75-year-old range, but uh, in Vietnam 50 years ago, that was very old indeed. Um, so this very wiry guy who's 75 years old uh, come gets rounded up by the Marines and brought into us, and we have to decide whether he's a prisoner of war, a civil defendant, or an innocent civilian. So one of the questions was, uh, you know, did you ever help the Viet Cong? And he said, uh, yes, I carried rice uh, for the Viet Cong um, down from North Vietnam on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And so in our way of looking at it, that made him a civil defendant. And so that was not an issue for the Marines or the military to deal with. That was an issue for the uh, local constabulary. He was a civil defendant. And so we would take people like that out to the local headquarters and turn them over to the local police. 
So in that particular case, the local police um, put him in jail for two weeks as a punishment for helping the Viet Cong. <laughs> and then uh, two weeks later, you know, about maybe three or four hundred detainees later, he comes through again. And I said, wow, you know, does this guy look familiar? Let's look back in our records and see if we have his name. And sure enough, we had his name and we did recognize him. So, you know, again, we asked him, have you ever helped the Viet Cong? And he said, yes, I helped the Viet Cong carry rice down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, same answer. And so here we are, stuck in this endless loop and um, so we didn't have any choice we were marines i i sir and so um, um, having that answer we had no choice but to take him back out to the local constabulary <laughs> and the the poor man must have thought that he was on a merry-go-round anyway uh, so you know sometimes maybe the rules need to be bent. I, when I was 24 years old and serving as a first lieutenant in the Marine Corps, I wasn't going to bend any any rules like that. But probably it would be just as well to let the guy go because he had been in jail in the interim of the previous two weeks. And so <laughs> he's on his way out of jail and the Marines pick him up again. Oh, well. Okay. So, uh, so armed forces vocational aptitude battery okay uh yeah we um thomas and Payne. i we had a a different um, um a different test in the marine corps which was called the general qualification test um and for some reason they called it the gct even though it's qualification so it wasn't spelled with a a C, but it's called the GCT, and it's a kind of um, it's a kind of uh, uh, IQ test, I guess, and uh, and yes, it was pretty accurate, I think, and and stuck people in the right place, um, right. And Dan says, I see the quotation is pointing toward balance between Logos and Eros, and I, I think that that's true. And uh, Sean says, hey, I found your YouTube and very impressed at the level of the content. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. I appreciated your comment yesterday also. Uh, and, oh, I see. Thomas is talking about uh, the point being it was related to the Myers-Briggs reference. And um, so, you know, going back then, the point is that in military missions, we're trained, and this happened to me at every senior school I attended, um, that we would take, take and be trained in the Myers-Briggs. And so my uh, scores tended to get even more rigidly fixed in where they were, um, but um, <clears throat> but the point is that it um, military officers who are going places, let's say, who are haven't been weeded out, uh, tend to be S and T people. They get all the details and they can think about the details, but they can't think, they're, they're not very good at thinking about what could possibly go wrong, and they're not very good at thinking at uh, what the consequences of this plan might be for innocent civilians and what have you. And, um, and so uh, we're trained in the U.S. military to uh, include within our teams people that have all the personality types or or at least um, of the four main personality types, sensing, uh, intuition, thinking, and feeling, uh, we need in all of our teams people from all those personality types so that we can think through the problem thoroughly. Um, so Andy Oxide said, I know this is slightly off to topic, but I'd love to know 
what you think about the red book. Um, okay, let me address the red book briefly. Uh, and Jerome says, not sure about your statement about yoga teachers. Yoga does provide techniques to access the arrow side. Um, well, I agree with that, Jerome. And also, I uh, agree that um, my comments are trying to follow Dr. Jung's text, but let's keep in mind that Dr. Jung was writing 90 years ago, and he was quite ignorant about um, the East. He, he admitted uh, in the foreword of the book and uh, in various places throughout the essay uh, that he was only just getting exposed to China uh, and to Eastern thought for the first time. And in fact, um, uh, Richard uh, Wilhelm's interaction with him really saved him because he was uh, discovering things over the period from 1913 to 1928 uh, in his own experience, in his own Red Book experience, and in his consulting room, uh, which he could not uh, place in human thought. He was trying to place it in human thought historically, and he wasn't finding a handle in uh, Western thought or a proper connection. He had an intuition that it had something to do with alchemy, but it was only when um, Richard Wilhelm came back from China in 1928 and brought to him the secret of it. Well, he brought to him the entire I Ching and um, and including the secret of the golden flower. And by, have, by talking with Dr. Jung and explaining to him what it was, Dr. Jung says, aha, this is exactly what I've been looking for. And the significant thing, which we'll get to in a moment here, is that um, the symbols that were coming up in dreams and visions of his patients were identical to symbols that came up in uh, Chinese psyches in The Secret of the Golden Flower, which is thousands of years old. So uh, that really allowed him to connect up and was basically the reason why he then uh, wrote three major books on um, alchemy, among other, uh, among other things that he wrote. Now, Andy, uh, going back to your, what I think about the Red Book. The Red Book uh, was Dr. Jung's experimentation on himself. And I think that it would be useful for you to uh, go back to the top of the chat here and go through to the link for the encounters with the greater personality. Because um, what Dr. Edinger said to us in that lecture was that the purpose of Jungian analysis is, is to engender um, that kind of an encounter. And uh, he said that the reason that he uh, gave lectures like that was to alert people to the fact that they can happen to you without analysis. And that happened to me. Um, and uh, I had exposure to Jungian psychology. And exposure to Jungian psychology just alone can engender one of these encounters. And uh, in the other lecture, the lecture about uh, individuation, he talks about how, the fact that once you have uh, one of these encounters, the experience, um, then you know, then you have no need for a creed. In terms of religion, you have no need for a creed. Then um, you don't have, to, you have no need to believe because you know. And uh, for me, the epiphany of that came uh, one time about 15 years ago when I uh, happened to be watching the YouTube video of Dr. Jung him, say, himself saying, uh, I have no need to believe I know. And I said, aha, 
I know, and therefore, um, you know, that attracted me even more strongly into Dr. Jung's oeuvre. So, um, so the point is that uh, one needs to understand what is meant by this numinous experience, and I think an excellent description of that is in Dr. Edinger's uh, lecture, which I transcribed, and you can find at that link, Encounters with the Greater Personality. Um, but as I say, that happened to me. Now, it also happened to many biblical figures, including uh, Moses, including Job, including Jacob, uh, including Paul. And you'll remember that in most of those cases, if not all, uh, they were describing dreams or visions. And uh, the book of Revelation is like that also. Uh, John of Patmos' uh, book of Revelation, which ends the Bible. And, um, and so those were uh, revelatory experiences for them. But in Dr. Jung's case, he was a psychiatrist living 2,000 years later and trying to look at uh, the Bible and analyze it from the point of view of a psychiatrist. And so he, and he was aware from his experience at the Bergoldsley working with actual um, mental, mentally ill people, uh, what kinds of things they were seeing in their psyche. And he was having visions at, at this time, at the early time. Uh, so in December of uh, 1913, uh, he started to have, he had the first of uh, five visions that were prefigurations of World War I. He didn't know what was happening to him at the time. He knew as a psychiatrist that he might be having a psychotic experience. Um, and so he kept mum about it, but these events kept happening and he began to experiment on himself. So he's started to go into his deep unconscious uh, to see what he could vision because he understood how to do that. And so whereas the biblical figures had tended to have you know, one-off experiences or experiences in the case of Job, maybe he had five or 10 experiences over his lifetime. But in the case of Dr. Jung, he had an ongoing experience for five years. Um, and the Red Book is uh, a version of what he experienced. Now, keep in mind that Sono Sham Dasani, who is the editor of the Red Book, uh, spent 13 years putting this book together. And he was working from about uh, eight, eight or nine uh, so-called black books, which were uh, Dr. Jung's um, uh, experimental notes, basically his, his uh, uh, scientific notes that he was taking on his own experiences. He was keeping track of things. And so um, then he was going back over this period, starting in 1913 up until 1928, he um, refined that experience and put it, put those things in a very special way. He, he was treating them with uh, special reverence because he wanted to keep in contact with his soul. And so he was treating it very reverently. And as you probably know, if you looked at the Red Book, uh, you'll know that about 200 pages of it are in uh, German calligraphy that is handwritten by Carl Jung in this book. Well, these were pages that he very carefully wrote in calligraphy. They were based on his black books, um, but he was refining them somewhat. And so, uh, and then they were put in a folio book, a large folio book that was in effect a scrapbook, a scrapbook of his um, 
of his paintings and of these calligraphy pages. And so what Sonu Shamdasani did for us is he translated the scrapbook, the, the Red Book, which was never published in Jung's lifetime. And he was very reluctant uh, to publish it during his lifetime because he thought people would not understand it since it was his, his notes of, of his um, excursions into his own unconscious. And he didn't feel people would really understand it. And uh, Dr. Shamdasani, uh, to his great credit, realized, number one, knew that um, the Red Book existed. And he also knew that major portions of it were in various libraries around the world. He found uh, some manuscript versions of it uh, in um, Yale Library, in the manuscript division of the Yale Library. And so what he did was he went to the heirs of C.G. Jung in the mid-1990s, and he convinced them to let him publish it because he said, you know, these things are going to come out one way or another, and it would be best if it comes out in a very excellent version. And so that's what he did with the folio edition of the book. Um, and I don't, well, I have it. Hold on a second. Okay, so this is very hard to wield around. <laughs> but this is the Red Book of C.G. Young, officially called Liber Novus. And um, the first 200 pages of it are um, these calligraphy pages that I mentioned, mentioned. And they include, they're, they're like a illustrated medieval manuscript. And that was sort of what he had in mind. And uh, so you can see each page has a, a painting. All these paintings were done by Dr. Young and plus the German calligraphy. Okay, now that's a doorstop. I don't get it out very often, but I've had to have it out in the last couple of days and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, but there is a um, reader's edition of the Red Book. The big edition is about $150 on Amazon these days. And the smaller, the reader's edition has none of the plates in it, uh, but it has all the words and um, or all the translations, let's say. And so um, if you're into reading the Red Book, I don't recommend it as a place to start in Jungian psychology because it will just uh, confuse you. Um, but once you get into his work, then you'll understand. Uh, let me just see if I can quickly find. Okay, in the beginning of the Red Book, he, and this is him explaining what it was. The years of which I have spoken to you, when I pursued the inner images, were the most important time of my life. Everything else is to be derived from this. It began at that time, and the later details hardly matter anymore. My entire life consisted in elaborating what had burst forth from the unconscious and flooded me like an enigmatic stream and threatened to break me. That was the stuff and material for more than only one life. Everything later was merely the outer classification, the scientific elaboration, and the integration into life. But the numinous beginning, which contained everything, was then. And he wrote that in 1957. And uh, then at the end of the Red Book, let me see if I can find his ending here quickly. Yep, can't 
find it in that version easily. Let's see. Well, um, I can't quickly find for the benefit of our listening audience, I'm sorry to say, um, how he ended the book, but he literally ended it in the middle of a sentence. He simply stopped in the middle of a sentence. And what caused him to stop was his meeting with Richard Wilhelm, which is the point that we're coming into his career now as we're talking about uh, the Secret of the Golden Flower. So at that point, when Wilhelm came and presented him with the Secret of the Golden Flower, that allowed him to take what had been happening to him for 15 years and contextualize it in a sense of human experience going back thousands of years. And that's what the I Ching was, because he was seeing the same symbols in the I Ching and the secret of the golden flower that he had seen in his examining room uh, among European patients. And so that was the significance of it. And so, so the Red Book, uh, you know, we can talk about the Red Book all night and I might do a sesh, a few sessions on the Red Book, but I think we ought to focus on a few other things first. And um, my uh, reaction to it was that I was, uh, I was reading um, a book by um, Dr. Clarissa Pincola Estes called Women Who Run With the Wolves. Uh, in 1993, my mother gave that book to my wife for Christmas. And the day after Christmas, I picked it up and started reading it. And I told my wife she couldn't have it back until I was finished, and I finished in two days. And what that did was it kicked off for me an encounter, the kind of a encounter that Dr. Edinger is talking about. And my encounter uh, lasted for eight months and it emerged as a novel. And it was a novel that I um, couldn't really cope with some of the consequences of, but it, it included, uh, the process included uh, a psychogenic experience every day with the heroine of the novel literally waking me up every morning at 6 a.m. and making me sit down and write until 8 or 9 in the morning, 500 to 1,000 words. And at the time, I just thought I was having some sort of creative frenzy like a famous novelist might have. And um, so I just went with the flow, uh, thinking that, okay, this is what famous writers are talking about when they have writer's block. Uh, but that didn't entirely satisfy me. I put the novel in my drawer for um, 21 years. And, um, but in 2009, when the Red Book was published, then I realized that that's what, what had happened to me. What happened to Dr. Jung is what happened to me. And I recognized the uh, parallels. So, I mean, I didn't have the same experiences that Dr. Jung had, obviously. I mean, I didn't meet Philemon or Elijah or Salome or a snake as he did. As he did. <laughs> but I had experiences that were related to me. And that contextualized it for me. And it's one of the reasons why I'm so firmly into Jungian study. Um, but anyway, I hope that that helps. I, I, I don't think I can get too much further into the Red Book tonight. Okay, so um, 
Thomas Dennis says there's a great biographical movie about Wilhelm created by his daughter, Wisdom of Changes. That's good to know. I did not know that. And I will uh, look for that in the coming week. Thank you very much, Thomas, for that. Um, I'll make a note of that, that in... Okay, um, so I'll take a look at that very soon. Uh, Sean says, did you learn anything about his descriptions of multiple personality disorders? I'm very cu curious about this type of dissociation. Um, well, actually, um, Dr. Jung does mention this in a lot later part of the of the Secret of the Golden Flower, uh, which I'm not going to get to tonight. There's no way. In, in fact, uh, as I said, this is really a short course on Jungian psychology, so it's going to take uh, several weeks to get through this essay. Uh, but for example, uh, here's uh, the last image in the Secret of the Golden Flower, and what he says about this image, what, what it's showing here is a guru that is envisioning five people and he's envisioning them envisioning five people. And what he says is that if you can integrate that uh, into your consciousness, then it's okay. But if you can't integrate it, then that uh, is, uh, that becomes a, um, a symptom of schizophrenia. Now, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not uh, going to make, give you any advice about uh, multiple personality disorder. I think that you need, I'm just repeating what he says uh, here. And so, um, you know, I think that you need, if, if you're interested in multiple personality disorder, please uh, look at the literature on that and and don't use me as <laughs> as a source of information um, but I can tell you that in this essay uh, what he says about that particular image that I just showed you uh, is that if you're a meditation master and in your meditation you're having those visions and you can incorporate them and hold them together in your psyche, then, you know, that's fine. And that means that you have a wider and deeper uh, psyche. But if, if you don't integrate them, then that's a symptom of schizophrenia. That's what he says. I'm now, I'm not an expert. I'm not a I've never studied psychology officially, uh, only uh, self-taught. So please don't take me as the um, guru on that. Uh, and Andy says uh, he had an experience also. So Andy, I, I urge you um, to go and take a look at that Edinger uh, lecture. I think you'll find that very helpful. Uh, and Sean says, yeah, trying to convince others will lead to suffering if they are incapable of listening. And, you know, very often people aren't capable of listening. I was, uh, I have been lucky because uh, a number of people uh, came to my meetup group, which I began here in Annapolis. I had no idea um, <clears throat> whether I would get anybody or not, but fortunately over more than a year and a half, uh, we had something like 75 meetings uh, before I had to have my ankle replaced. And, um, and people kept coming, so I kept talking about it, and I kept putting the videos online here. And then when I was incapacitated for six weeks, I started to do them online. And so I was lucky to find people who have interest. And um, so Thomas Dennis is such a difficult text, nor Liber Novus. Um, yeah, the, I mean, it's all difficult, uh, Thomas. It's um, Dr. Jung's writing isn't for the faint of heart. You don't read Jung like you would read a novel, that's for sure. And um, I urge you, as we uh, talk about 
some of these books to look at the Ed Edinger lectures which relate to those books and um, you can find some of my comments on the on this channel with the reading of uh, the the answer to Job book. Um, we are on Thursdays now beginning a, a course on ion, uh, and in that course, I'm incorporating uh, Dr. Edinger's lectures, which appear in um, the ion lectures. Let's see if I put my finger on it. Okay, so here's Ed Edinger's book, The Ion Lectures, by Inter published by Inner City Books. And ION, of course, is um, volume 929II of the Collected Works of C.G. Young, which is published by Princeton University Press. And so I'm working with both of those books going through those lectures. And um, I will, let's see here, see if I can... Uh, give you okay I'm gonna put a ticker on the screen <clears throat> which um, tells you how you can participate in those lectures if you have interest um, let's see uh, might I think I might have put the wrong ticker up so let me do do that okay uh, so you can write to me if you want to participate we um, began with the introductions last week but I'm creating video of all the sessions so we have a advanced reading group Dropbox where if you miss the early sessions you can come back to them and see them um, so uh, Let's see, Thomas says, at page 136 of Secret of the Golden Flower in my ancient copy, there are some black and white illustrations that are not dissimilar to some of the images in Liber Novus. I wonder if there is a connection. Um, I certainly think there probably is a connection, and uh, Dr. Jung um, would say so. Um, by the way, if if you can't afford the big version of Liber Novus, you can um, you can just go online and look for the Red Book uh, images. And I'm thinking of one in particular uh, that, if I can just glance through and find it, I'll I'll show you one that I. I would concur with you. Um, and this is why Dr. Jung was saying that uh, these things are, um, are common symbolic images across societies. Uh, let's see if I can quickly find it. Maybe, maybe a bridge too far. Um, okay, well, here would be one that would be on that order, although there is one that's got a got a guru. All these paintings were painted by Dr. Jung. I, I'm sorry I can't immediately find the one I was thinking of, but the one I'm thinking of has the guru flo actually floating above a Swiss city with a mandala above his head. And um, and so uh, that is somewhat like the image that um, I was just showing you from uh, 
from this uh, you know, collected works version of the secret of the golden flower. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Young says they are made by patience. Uh, okay, I, I'm not familiar with the uh, version that you have. I may have seen it, and um, there are uh, versions that uh, Louis LaFontaine has shown me in the past uh, that did have mandalas and various other things that patients had drawn. So uh, that's quite possible, Thomas. Um, I. Um, um, but anyway, those images that you're describing just now are not in uh, this book, okay? They're not in uh, volume 13 of the collected works. Um, but I have seen something like that. Uh, and Thomas says Edinger does look intriguing. Uh, he should. He wrote... 17 books uh, explaining the significance of Dr. Young's work for religion, and it's, uh, it's very important stuff. Um, so anyway, in terms of um, the images, Thomas and others, I would say that uh, just go on to Google and put in um, you know, Carl Jung Red Book images, and it'll immediately pop up all the images for you. Um, and and Andy says, "Would I ever create my own grimoire?" Uh, I'm not sure I know what a grimoire is. You've you've uh, out intellectualized me here. Uh, let me see what uh, what that means. Define uh, grimoire. That's a you pulled a new word on me here. A manual of magic or witchcraft used by witches and sorcerers. Um, I would say that I would not be doing that, and I don't, um, if that's what it is, uh, and then a grimoire is a textbook of magic, typically including instructions on how to create magical things, I guess. Um, I would not be doing that, uh, although I did, I did do a, a course, a four-week long course, on uh, the tarot and you can find that on the youtube channel uh, just do a, a um, search on my youtube channel which you're on now and you will find it uh, and i can probably tell you where to look here um, quickly it might be a little easier um, you know, people think of the um, of the tarot as woo-woo type stuff, uh, but it is not that. It is actually grounded in the unconscious and in uh, archetype. And um, so, if I can bring that up, it. Uh, Videos. YouTube has to think about it. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. So there are actually fourteen videos uh, on. Um, on the tarot, which I put online here. And so if you want to learn the tarot or use the tarot in terms of um, analyzing your psyche, 
uh, that it is a tool that you can use for that purpose. Um, let's see. I'm just looking for the first one here. Okay, here's the link. All right, so I'm going to give you the link to the first tarot lesson, and it has within it uh, my caveats on that. Uh, I don't consider tarot a woo-woo type of thing. I consider it a way to access your unconscious. And in terms of dealing with other people, I, if you become a Tarot reader, uh, you need to be aware that you're accessing other people's unconscious. And it, it's, uh, in a way, it's a kind of party trick, but it also works to access the unconscious. And it always works. And so uh, I've boasted, and I can tell you that it's true that if I went into an auditorium with a thousand people in it and uh, threw the tarot cards across the stage in no special layout and simply did a reading, everyone in the room would think I had done a reading for them as long as they would give me the benefit of the doubt. And that's because the tarot is so full of archetypal in images that it touches everyone and uh, it can't fail to do that. Um, and so, yeah, so Dennis says grimoire means black book. No, um, well, you know, I have 30 years of, of my own books. They're not black, but I have notes from my business career and and uh, from my whole career. I think I might have thrown some of them away when I moved, uh, but I certainly have the recent ones. And so Thomas says, does Dr. Young intend to use the commentary as a sort of warning to we Occidentals as we might begin to study Eastern texts? Um, yeah, there's sort of an element to that, and I I think that relates to the fact that Dr. Jung himself was relatively ignorant about the East, and um, I, you know, let's remember where he was in, you know, 1913 to 18 when he was doing his Red Book. He, um, or when he was having his visioning experiences, he hadn't worked all this stuff out at that time. And so you can see time periods in his earlier career uh, when he hadn't worked out a lot of ideas. And, um, and he knew that, that if you have an encounter, um, it can go wrong. And I acknowledge that, you know, mine could have gone wrong if if I didn't have a strong ego. Uh, and, you know, I was able to um, control it. Um, and, um, and the reason I didn't um, put it out originally, it's now available on our Dropbox uh, for free to people who are on our Dropbox, but it's also uh, available um, on Amazon as uh, Mako Memoirs of a Woman. It's about a woman who is sold by her father to pay a debt uh, when she's 15 years old and becomes the first woman prime minister of Japan. Uh, that's the fundamental story, uh, but it contains, uh, shall I say euphemistically, uh, certain erotic passages. And so that's what uh, worried me originally, and I didn't really know where all that was coming from. I now recognize that those were shadow elements of my own psyche, and so I can now explain what they are and where they came from, but uh, for the longest time I couldn't, and so I left the book uh, in my drawer, and I only published it in Kindle version on uh, Amazon in 
Um, let's see. Yes, Thomas. Um, yeah, he w he was saying be careful, and you know that's what Edinger is saying too. He he's saying that you know once you start off these archetypal uh, items or you start the individuation process, it can be dangerous, and um, you need to understand what you're dealing with because. Ultimately, when you get at depth in your own psyche, you come face to face with evil. Um, and, um, and you need to have a strong enough ego so that you can handle that. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know what more to say beyond that, but, um, you know, the opposites... Uh, exist in all of us and uh, you no one who's watching this should kid themselves that they don't have an evil part down deep down in there and so you need to be ready for it and you need to have a strong enough ego because um, the your unconscious um, has developed um, instinctually and evolutionarily over three and a half billion years since the first single-celled organisms were. You know, we all have a grandparent that was a single-celled organism, believe it or not, and we're in a continuous line of sons and daughters since then. Uh, and, um, and the psyche that developed in the deep unconscious is uh, is energized by opposites and uh, Jung mentions that in this reading and um, and so among the things that are in there are things that are not appropriate uh, for 21st century life and so when you experience those things uh, it is very important that you have developed a strong enough ego uh, so that you can make proper moral decisions um, about what comes up. You have there's two streams coming up out of the um, out of the unconscious. One's on the good side, one's on the dark side, and you have to be able to differentiate in your ego, in your conscious mind, and decide. Uh, what is appropriate because um, your unconscious doesn't have to live in the 21st century. You know, it was put together um, and finalized on the day of your birth, uh, but you and your ego does have to live in the 21st century, and so you can't just um, bubble up things that are not appropriate. Miles says, I find it interesting that I know several people like you who are eminently intelligent. They then have a belief that causes me cognitive dissonance, like a tarot or extraterrestrials, not a criticism. Well, um, you know, the tarot is not a belief, Miles. Uh, I know what the tarot does, and um, it works on the basis of a conversation. So, um, you know, if I say the word boat, um, I have no idea what comes into your mind when I say the word boat. Um, you know, it could be a canoe, it could be a rowboat, it could be a 25-foot power yacht, it could be a 40-foot sailboat, it could be a a yacht like the founders of, uh, of uh, Microsoft have, or it could be uh, the Queen Mary. I, don't, I have no idea what would come to your mind when I say that word. And so, uh, but what I do know about the Tarot is that the Tarot is based on um, 
on archetype and particularly the major arcana. And so if you go back and listen to my classes, beginning with the one that I gave you the link for, uh, you will find the appropriate caveats, but you will also find why uh, I say what I say about it. It's I'm not going to do it all now again because it was uh, uh, about a 10 hour teaching at least in total. Uh, but, um, you know, when I, when I say something about uh, your mother based on the Empress card, if I'm reading the Tarot, I would read the Empress card as mother. And so if I say something about mother uh, from the Emp Empress card, I know it's going to affect you because you're, you have a relationship with your mother. <laughs> and, and so there, it's not a question of ooey ooh, it's not a question of belief, it's a, uh, a question of fact. And, um, and I know I can't um, know what reading you hear. As I say, if I gave a reading to a thousand people, um, everyone would hear a different reading uh, because everyone is listening and hearing these same words, but every word is different. And uh, I read this the other day, but I'll read it again. This is from the Red Book, from the Reader's Edition, and I'm reading from page 244. Um, and so Jung's psyche says to him in, in the form of the anchorite, the anchorite is speaking in Jung's vision, and he says, you must know one thing above all. A succession of words does not have only one meaning, but men strive to assign only a single meaning to the sequence of words in order to have an unambiguous language. This striving is worldly and constricted and belongs to the deep, deepest layers of the divine creative plan. On the higher levels of insight into divine thoughts, you recognize that the sequence of words has more than one valid meaning. And so, you know, the, a tarot reader is simply reading, um, you know, their version of what they see on on the reading and you're reacting to it in the way you react to it. I have no idea how you're hearing my tarot reading, but I know that it will reach you at a very deep level because I'm talking about archetypes. It's as simple as that. And so it's not a question of me believing, uh, and it's not a question of extraterrestrials. And, and uh, interestingly, uh, as you probably saw here, I'm, I'm going to move into a uh, uh, discussion of the movie Arrival here in a, in a moment, which is about extraterrestrials. Um, so Thomas Des Dennis says, one can appreciate the archetypal nature of the images of the tarot without putting up a fortune-telling sign in the front of one's home. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I sometimes do readings for myself if I'm uh, trying to understand what my psyche thinks about something. Uh, I, I do do readings. And... Um, you know, you don't have to take it as gospel. It's uh, you just um, you just learn from it. Okay. So anyway, move, moving on, I'll, I'll get here to some more interesting stuff. So let's see. Um, we're up to um, okay. We talked about the yoga teachers and. Um, and being in a mist of words and ideas, which is what pure logos is. Um, and so then he's saying, and as we've talked about before, just trying to understand what you're seeing on the screen here. I want to see from paragraph four here. So he's uh, making the comment about when the wrong man uses the right means, the right means work in the wrong way. And so, um, you know, 
Miles or anyone, if you go and buy a tarot book at Barnes and Noble and you put out a reading and then read the definitions uh, from the tarot book, uh, yeah, it'll have some meaning, but it uh, it will work in the wrong way uh, because it won't be um, it won't be organic from you. I mean, if you're going to be a tarot reader, then you have to be a tarot reader, and you have to build up some confidence and understanding about what it means. And so, um, so anyway, an example of this uh, came in the movie Arrival, and uh, my wife and I uh, have purchased this movie because uh, we like it very much. It's extremely Jungian. Um, and uh, as you probably know, if you saw it, if you didn't see it, um, I urge you to see it about 10 times so you might then understand it. Uh, but I, I just want to um, uh, comment on a couple of things. Uh, <clears throat> the, the gist of the plot is that aliens arrive on Earth, and they arrive in tw 12 vehicles that park over different parts of the world. And in the early part, um, they're attempting to identify a linguist who um, who will be able to interact with the aliens and understand where they come from and why are they here and that sort of thing. And keep in mind that these aliens are impervious to anything we do to them, so or try to do to them. And so we're just trying to understand what's going on. And so there's a... Um, So the the hero, the heroine of the movie is, uh, in the movie, her name is Louise. And Louise uh, is asked what something means. And she says, I, I'm not going to be able to tell you unless I go there. And uh, the army officer um, refuses to take her. And so he's saying that he's going to go on to Berkeley, where there's another linguist. And she says, well, ask him what the Sanskrit word for war is. And what happens, um, you know, five minutes later in the movie is that the, the colonel is back and the guy in Berkeley had said the uh, word for war was argument, um, which is a, a literalist dictionary definition, logos definition of the word. And she says um, the meaning of it is a desire for more cows, which is a reference to greed and which is a reference to the causes of war. And, and, um, and so um, uh, Forrest Whitaker, who's playing the colonel, uh, takes her, obviously. She's the heroine of the movie um, because she... Uh, grocks it. She's got the Eros um, interpretation. And, um, and the other interesting thing is at the end of the movie, um, the Chinese general in a vision um, whispers in her ear what his wife, the last words his wife said to him before she died. And this is and she's having this as a prefiguration vision. And what he says to her, uh, this is online, you can't hear it in the movie. Um, and so it was sort of obfuscated in the movie, but uh, fans of the movie have discussed it online. Um, war doesn't produce winners, only widows. And uh, so this was a Chinese woman saying to her Chinese general husband as she's dying that phrase in Mandarin, of course. And, um, and so because she has this prefiguration, this vision of what the general said to her and told her, then she's able in the moment uh, to go back and say that to him over the telephone. And it's a very complicated movie about 
um, the insubstantiality of the time-space continuum. So, um, and uh, there, there's just so much Jungian stuff, we'd have to spend a whole evening only talking about that, uh, which we can do in the future. But um, I've, uh, my wife and I have been making quite a study over, of it over the last year or so, and we've probably seen it at least um, 10 times. And uh, Thomas, uh, just for your information, there's also a review of Arrival on uh, the Archetype in Action website. Uh, let's see, I, I suppose I can give you my, my review of it. I'm not sure I can quickly, but I will try. Um, let's just see if I can find it quickly. Thinking about it. finding other people's reviews that I apparently published here. Uh, so I don't want to keep you waiting necessarily. Um, Just a second. I think, ah, here we go. All right. So here's mine. I, I actually haven't read this review in a period of time, but if you, uh, I, I wrote this very shortly after I saw the movie the first time. Uh, so it might interest you to take a look at that. Uh, but let's, let's go back. Um, so we're up to paragraph five of 71 paragraphs. And uh, we've spent an hour and a half, as you see, it gets complicated. And uh, so people think that Jungian psychology is simple and can be written off with a few highlights, and that is not true. Okay, so um, let's see. Andy says, have I put together an ontology of this phenomenon? I don't know what phenomenon you're referring to, Andy, so maybe you could clarify that for me. Figure three in Golden Flower is identical to figure in Folio Red Book, page 159, details about this footnote folio, page 318. So, since you've challenged me, Jerome, let me pull out 159 here. Okay, so, is, it, is, that, the, is that the image you're referring to? Uh, I have to get this so I can see what I'm showing you. Uh, is, is that, there's an image. That's 159 of the folio edition. And uh, then 318. If 
folio, page 318. All right, so the image with the legend um, 9 January 1927 uh, by my friend Herman Z, who died at age 52, a luminous flower in the center with stars rotating about it, uh, um, around the flower walls with eight gates the whole conceived as a transparent window. This mandala was based on a dream noted on January 2nd, 1927 uh, from the town ma map. Uh, I may not be looking at the right footnote here. Um, anyway, I don't, I don't really want to get into <laughs> the, the ins and outs of the Red Book or we'll never recover. Uh, but um, everyone has that link so you can all refer to it um, and that would be interesting um, and um, okay all right so we're up, up to chapter let's hope okay um, so um, what Jung says in paragraph five is that Western imitation is a tragic misunderstanding. We need both instinct, eros, and rationality, logos. Uh, our task, task is not missionary, not to imitate, imitate, but to integrate both in the psyche. Okay, so his point is that uh, it's you know, these things have to grow within us um, organically. And, um, and so you can't just transplant um, Western ideas or Christian ideas on another society that's come up organically in a completely different way. Uh, yes, he proved that we're all at base the same, and I'm going to get into that. Uh, maybe not later tonight because we're not going to have time. But um, but our that we shouldn't be missionizing uh, people, and we shouldn't be trying to imitate them. But we should be trying to in integrate um, what they're doing within our psyche, and that makes us wider, deeper, and broader. And um, and so I think that was basically his point uh, on paragraph five. Uh, paragraph six, utter unworldliness of the text. Uh, nothing, um, nothing prevents the Chinese from glimpsing the invisible essence of things. And so um, I make a note here about um, my Kodiak kindergarten candy thief. Uh, some of you may have heard me mention this before, uh, but there was, um, when I lived in Kodiak, Alaska, I was six and seven years old, and um, in my kindergarten class was uh, another boy who was a liar, and um, I could always see when he was lying. It was like um, I was seeing a light that went on around him, a kind of aura around him when he was lying. So I always knew that he was lying. And so I always saw the invisible essence of things around this boy. And um, I don't know, you can take it for what it's worth, but um, you know, there's definitely an experience that I had 
when I was six and seven years old that was a numinous experience to me. I still remember it very clearly. Um, and I remember where I was and how I was talking to him and what the topic was. And, um, <clears throat> and so the, what Dr. Jung is saying here is that the Chinese have developed organically a way to see into the invisible essence of things. The unconscious basically is what he's talking about. And, um, And so one of the things that he's emphasizing is that it's sensible to fulfill the, your instinctive demands versus fear-ridden repression, uh, which can only cause neurosis. And, um, and that causes uh, inescapable psychological, psychologic conclusions. Uh, we're talking about uh, paragraph six now. And um, and so his point is the, and this relates to individuation as well, that all of us know how to become a human being, okay, unconsciously, uh, just like an oak tree uh, grows from an acorn, and that acorn has within it the essence of becoming an oak tree. And not only that, it becomes the, that unique oak tree. There are no two oak trees the same, and yet every oak tree has certain characteristics about it that make it an oak tree. And so the same applies to human beings. And, um, and so that's the individuation process. And so... Um, one of the aspects of individuation that Dr. Jung is, talks about is the fact that we have to try to be in connect, uh, connect as much as possible with the unconscious, which is the part of us that knows how to be um, a human being. Uh, and, and to fulfill what the instinct is making us become. Obviously, our instinct knows how to make a heart, and it knows how to make our stomach and our lungs, and it knows how to uh, copy the cells of those organs throughout our lifetime so that we change our cells every seven years, as so they say. Um, I'm not an expert on that. Um, but in any case, um, the objective that Dr. Young tries to uh, approach is an objective of becoming um, what you were meant to be and what the meaning of your life is. And only you can do that through understanding your own unconscious. Um, obviously, some aspects of it um, you do um, without, um, without any conscious awareness of what the unconscious does. Uh, obviously, all your cell reproduction and that sort of thing is done without you having any awareness of it. Um, but, uh, and so, you know, probably more than 95% of the becoming of you happens totally automatically. Um, but that little bit that refers to you, that creates this ego self axis that's the part that you want to try to expand on the ego side as much as possible. And um, so in paragraph uh, seven, he's talking about beware of uh, confusing the intellect with the spirit uh, instinct. Uh, and a couple of examples that I have are if you ever um, go to the art store or the tool department in Sears. It happens in both places for me. Um, you know, I immediately start thinking of all the projects I could do that I would love to do uh, with the art supplies or with the tools at Sears. And uh, so I take that feeling as 
instinctual as as my instinct saying man i'd like to go create and do something with those things it's the um and uh so that spirit is greater than intellect and um and uh i often i've done things with art and painting and um i've done things with writing obviously too and i've done things with tools made made things uh, in many different forms. Um, and so what I find is that my life works better when I'm creating. And one of the funny things that you might uh, think hilarious is that um, I think a lot of, uh, I, I think highly of these adult coloring books and why. And the reason is because they give you the opportunity uh, to express something. And it's not that I've used them a lot. I, my mother-in-law uh, loves them and, and does a lot of things with them. Uh, but on one occasion, my, my wife bought me uh, 24 colored pencils and an adult coloring book. So uh, I was working on a mandala uh, from this adult coloring book, book. And I said to myself, well, I, what I want to do is I want to know what my unconscious wants to do because this is a creative activity. And so I want to be um, sensitive to what's coming through from my unconscious. And so what I did was I would sit there and I would look at each little space that was already delineated. The picture was already delineated in black and white on this coloring book. And so I would look at each space and then I would look at the 24 pencils and I just sort of let my finger go down the, the line and pick the um, pencil that my psyche said it wanted at that time. I tried to be sensitive to that. And so I started to do that. And after an hour, all of a sudden, I just started to sob. And uh, I've had that experience before. I've described it on video on the YouTube channel here, uh, where that's definitely a breakthrough uh, to the unconscious. And uh, what I found is that when I'm doing something creative, whatever it is, and I consider doing this YouTube channel one of my creative activities, um, my life simply works better. And it's not that I'm any great artist. I'm not going to ever uh, sell a lot of work. I've sold, sold a few paintings and I've sold a few books, but nothing uh, serious. And, um, but my life just generally works better uh, if I'm doing something creative. And, um, and so I don't know why it's a mystery, but it, it does work. Um, now also in this, um, in this paragraph seven, we're talking about, uh, I've taken um, figure six from uh, Edward Edinger's uh, Ion Lectures, uh, which, is his, which is his description of the ego self axis. And so when you're born, you're on this, in this left circle where the self encompasses the ego. You have no ego. Uh, children until they're about three years old uh, don't understand themselves as a separate being. And, um, and so they're totally consumed by the self. But as you move to the right on these various um, images here, uh, your ego becomes stronger and stronger until it separates itself from the self. And then you're on this axis between these, this duality between the self and the ego. And the self is always uh, the greater center 
of the, of the personality. Uh, as the ego becomes differentiated from the self in the process of psychological development. And uh, so I've talked heavily on this channel about um, about the development of ego, and you can find that under um, uh, how to have an authentic life. Um, and I'm referring to the Job archetype, which is how to build up your ego. And that is done by um, contest, defeat, uh, lamentation, rebirth. Okay, so what, what Dr. Edinger observed and even observed in his last interview before his death, uh, which you can find online, um, this is the Job archetype and, and this is the way uh, over your lifetime, uh, your ego builds up. So uh, if you think of a, of a little toddler um, who, um, you know, doesn't know any better, but at some point when they're two or three, uh, mommy or daddy uh, slaps their wrist for doing something or gives them a spanking to try to stop them from doing something or whatever it is, and so that's painful, and that's a defeat, uh, and they lament about that, and then they're reborn, and their ego starts to emerge as something separate from what it was before. And that keeps happening through life. Um, and so what Dr. Jung's observation was is that um, you want to... Um, have your ego pretty strong before you're uh, playing around with these archetypal uh, elements that are in your unconscious. Um, and uh, Thomas says uh, the comment about uh, my my comment about the value of creativity. Uh, he says as a writer. That statement rings the bell of truth for me, and I, I'm sure it does. And uh, someone whose identity I can't tell, but is MHH8, says, uh, you did LSD? And my answer to that is, no, I didn't. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's a long story, but I haven't really done drugs. Uh, and... Um, I think, uh, like Bill Clinton, I took one puff one time, uh, and <clears throat> because, as you can tell, I have this gravelly voice, and and um, it's because I I'm somewhat of an asthmatic. It's under it's well under control now, but when I was little, it was a big problem, and. Um, my father actually managed to get the Navy to station him on the Mojave Desert for three years to clear up my asthma when I was two years old, you know, starting when I was two years old. That was before uh, modern medicine figured out that asthma was about allergies. So I still have a little bit of asthma. And I apologize if I sound like a lunger sometimes, but, um, but because of that and even though my father and mother both smoked when I was little, I never took up smoking or uh, anything like that. And, uh, and I had a grandfather who was an alcoholic, and so I never really got into drinking like that either. Um, but anyway, um, let's see what... Uh, let's see... I, I think I'm going to call it quits at this point in the middle of paragraph seven. I apologize for that, but it's um, we've been on for nearly two hours here. And what happens is that um, YouTube um, will start cutting off the beginning of the video of this session after two hours. So um, I'm going to uh, call it quits 
for getting through uh, the secret of the golden flower. Uh, I will continue it. I expect uh, that at this rate, it's going to take uh, several more weeks to get through. It's a very complicated uh, section. And um, what, what I did, and you can see my, my notes in this book, um, and what I did was I tried to go through it and just check mark beside uh, the one important point in any given um, paragraph, and that was impossible. So um, I, I even have, on some lines, I have three check marks on a single line. And so it's, um, in terms of uh, Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group, uh, this is definitely an excellent essay uh, to try to understand because it was Dr. Jung himself trying to understand his own thinking in 1928. So it's before a lot of his major books. Um, and uh, what I would urge you to do is to read it slowly. Uh, you can find it online as a PDF. Um, and uh, if, if you're in our Dropbox, you can find a PDF of it as well. Um, and um, so you don't have to go out and run out and buy a copy because uh, there are free PDFs of it online. Uh, so I urge you to find a copy for yourself and read through it slowly and carefully. You can't read it like a novel. And I will uh, begin again in the middle of paragraph seven. Um, a week from today, and uh, I invite you all to join our advanced reading group, which meets at 1.30 on Thursdays, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Thursdays. If you are unable to attend at that time, uh, that time I set in part uh, to help our European uh, followers who cannot participate in this session because it's already in the early morning hours in Europe. Um, but if you are unable to attend a session, I am I have created a separate Dropbox called Advanced Reading Group, uh, and that is uh, only for uh, participants who are uh, prepared to sponsor my activity here. And But in that each week I'm putting uh, the session which is done on Zoom, not on YouTube. And so if you'd like to attend, please send me an email. I've been showing you the um, uh, my email address on this ticker throughout this session, so you'll be able to see it on the replay very shortly if you haven't made note of my uh, email address. So send me an email address uh, for for followers of this meeting every Monday night at 8. Um, there is a Dropbox which is quite comprehensive, um, which is available to you, and I will put you in that Dropbox for free. And the Advanced Reading Group Dropbox is, is for uh, my sponsors. And so are there any other comments here? Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, MHH8 says, I just listened to Sam Harris, number 127, all about LSD. Thanks for doing this. It is an easy material for me to understand. Uh, I, what I would observe is it's not easy material for anyone, including Dr. Young. It wasn't easy for him to write it in the first place. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I I have heard of Sam Harris, I and I've heard of him in uh, in the context of his uh, debates back and forth with uh, Jordan Peterson, but I I haven't followed him, and so I can't really comment on his thinking. Um, Dan says to all those watching, reading the chat. I highly recommend supporting Skip's work on Patreon. Not many channels producing content at this level. He deserves our support. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, 
sharing and liking also helps. And yes, that definitely will help. And Sean says, thanks for the stream. Thomas says, revisiting Secret of the Golden Flower, pondering my underlings, underlying linings from decades ago. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I mean, every time I get into this, uh, into some of these things, which I've read years ago, uh, I get deeper and deeper and I learn something more every time I do. And, you know, it's the same as watching this movie Arrival, which is so full of Jungian material. Um, as I say, we've watched it about 10 times and we're getting deeper and deeper into it. And uh, it's, it's, just an, it's just an incredible movie when you appreciate what, what they've done with it. Um, and yes, uh, Equity Dude says you should keep the replays here on YouTube. Uh, yes, I'm certainly intending to do that. And, um, and so uh, the replays of this session and other free work, which I did do like this, uh, this morning, and I should mention that here, where did it go? You see, I have a few books here. Okay, so I did a reading this morning from this book. Let me get my... Okay, so it's Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. This is volume two. And <coughs> this total project is to have three volumes, which um, will be 50 essays by Jungian analysts about the Red Book. And I urge you to get into this series because it's extremely powerful. Um, each one of these analysts looks at the Red Book, a different facet of the Red Book, a little bit different, each one of them. And so it becomes like a diamond. And um, I first read the uh, volume one at Christmas time, and I did do uh, a number of readings. If you look at the Red Book playlist, uh, you'll find 14 um, videos where I was reading from volume one, with the exception of today, I did number 14, which is from volume two. And I urge you to take a look at those videos, especially the uh, early ones. Um, in the early ones, I was reading from an essay by Thomas Arst, uh, who's one of the editors of this book, uh, along with Mary Stein, another famous Jungian. And so um, I urge you to uh, take a look at these books and take a look at my readings, and you'll start to see how powerful they really are. Um, not my readings, but, but these essays. And uh, so um, Thomas says, Arrival is free on Amazon Prime, by the way. Um, well, um, I think I bought it back before it was free. <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyway, um, when, when you see the writing of the aliens, if you haven't seen this movie, the writing of the aliens uh, is in the form of the Euroboros, which is a major part of the early psychological development of humanity. And um, if you look at... Um, Eric Neumann's book, The Origins uh, and History of Consciousness, um, you will find that about half of his book relates to the Ouroboros. And, and so the method of communicating of the aliens is exactly um, image, different uh, images of the Ouroboros. Um, and Equity Dude says, do I live in Canada? I do not. Um, 
I live in uh, Annapolis, Maryland, as a matter of fact. All right, so we are now three minutes over, and I'm going to have to stop streaming so that I don't lose uh, the first half of this video. Uh, so I hope to see you next week. I have many other videos online, so you can keep listening if you want to. Um, this is actually the 81st meeting, and I will be here again next Monday at the same time, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, Sean says, I enjoy reading Carl Jung out loud with my coffee by my side. It helps me reset my day if it's going bad. I, I think that that's a, a great idea, Sean, and, and actually my readings of it have been uh, for that kind of a purpose with me, too. So anyway, peace. Thank you all for joining tonight, and uh, I'll see you next week at 8 p.m. Uh, Monday. Or I hope to see you on Thursday at 1.30. If you haven't already uh, joined that uh, group, uh, I will be sending you the links for the Zoom session um, between now and Thursday. So see you then. Take care now. Um, I'm going to sign off.